Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Tokyo College uh, sponsored uh, macro policy for the growth and stability of Japan, lecture by Professor Kiyotaki Nobuhiro. My name is uh, Kosuke Aoki, Professor Graduate School of Economics at the University of College. Let me talk about uh, Tokyo College. Tokyo College is such that uh, uh, us uh, researchers uh, with citizens uh, think about uh, the future society. In uh, 2019, it was created within uh, Tokyo University. Uh, different uh, researchers uh, uh, gathered here and engaged in different kinds of research uh, to uh, think of uh, different matters uh, with you. Uh, we organize webinars of this kind. And you'll be able to see this uh, program uh, on YouTube. So uh, please. Uh, Sign in uh, to the uh, Tokyo uh, College uh, YouTube uh, channel. And uh, we'd like to thank the members of Tokyo College uh, for all of their support. Uh, and uh, to uh, Professor Nin, uh, we have had tremendous uh, support. Uh, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Nin. And uh, today we have. Uh, Professor Kiyotaki uh, Nobuhiro, uh, who will be talking about macroeconomic policies for growth and stability of Japan. And uh, BNP uh, Paribas uh, Nakazora uh, Mana, Vice Chairman, Vice Chairperson, uh, Global Markets, uh, uh, will be uh, commenting. So, first, uh, we will. Uh, introduce uh, Professor Kiyotaki. Uh, Professor Kiyo uh, earned his PhD uh, in at Harvard and uh, went to Wisconsin University, Minnesota University, and London School of Economics. Uh, and uh, presently, uh, he is professor at the Princeton University. Uh, macroeconomics is his expertise, uh, in particular, financial markets and uh, macroeconomics uh, fluctuation and the uh, relations between the two is an area where he's made tremendous uh, contributions. His research. Is not, is not only in academics, uh, but uh, is also uh, has gone a long way uh, toward macroeconomic policies implementation. And the Cabinet Office, uh, Economic and uh, uh, Council on Economic and Fiscal Policies, a special session uh, was where he participated as an expert. Uh, uh, Ms. Nakazora has graduated from Keio University and uh, has worked for Nomura Research Institute, Nomura Asset Management, uh, Morgan Stanley, and JP Morgan uh, before working for BNP at Paribus as chief credit uh, strategist, chief ESG strategist, vice president of global markets. Uh, she's uh, one of the emblematic uh, uh, credit analysts uh, in Japan, and she's very active and successful uh, during the Lehman crisis. Uh, Lehman uh, Brothers uh, issues uh, were uh, issues uh, that she uh, pointed to uh, before others, and uh, she has been the focus of much attention. And uh, since uh, before, she has participated in uh, 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 the Cabinet Office's uh, Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy as a uh, civilian. And we'd like to proceed with the program as follows. So we'd like to have uh, Professor Kiyotaki uh, give his presentation first. And then we'd like to uh, turn to uh, Ms. Nakazora for her comments. After that, uh, we'd like to have uh, Professor Kiyotaki reply, and after some discussion, if we have some extra time, we would like to entertain uh, questions uh, from the other participants. So if uh, those of you watching have questions, uh, please uh, use the Zoom Q&A session to raise your questions. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Professor Kiyotaki, please. Thank you very much for joining this event. Previously, I used to teach, uh, Professor Komiya used to be with the University of Tokyo when economists conduct a textbook like discussion on the economy. That's positive. That's what he had said. So today, I would like to try my best to observe the Japanese economy in a textbook-like manner and to analyze where we are today. The current situation of the Japanese economy is in low growth rate, fiscal unsoundness, low birth rate, 
aging of the population and low inflation, various challenges are faced. And the, there are more than one objective of economic policy, sustainable growth, environmental sustainability, improvement of social capital, appropriate distribution, or measures to respond to low birth rate and aging of the population and inflation-related policies. And when there are more than one objective in macroeconomic policy, at least the same number of policy measures are necessary. And amongst those policy measures, it could be measures that would contribute to one objective, but not to the other objective. Say the government offers subsidies to tackle low birth rate and aging population. It may contribute to birth rate and aging, but would be negative to fiscal balance. So depending on the means, they would be both positive and negative impact. So. Robert Mundell, according to Professor Robert Mundell, the most effective means should be assigned to each objective. And that's the standard basic law in economics. This is the title of my presentation. And if I turn one page and share with you this table, this describes the multiple objective of policy, sustainable growth, improvement of social capital, and appropriate distribution of social capital, responding to global warming in order to preserve the environment, and sustainability of fiscal soundness, is also another objective. And low birth rate and uh, aging population is yet another challenge, and stabilization inflation is yet another objective. Uh, it's impossible to rely just on one measure to solve all challenges. Each objective would require specific means. So assigning the most appropriate means to each objective is Mandel's policy assignment theory. So starting from sustainable growth, what's most effective for sustainable growth is technological progress. And what do we need to do in order to promote technological progress? The Japanese economy in relative terms will be shrinking, and therefore we need to take maximum use of the advantages of an open economy, goods, human resources, money, and ideas. There has to be active flow of these elements between Japan and other countries, and that is necessary in achieving technological progress, and that is considered to be the most effective means. And in order to achieve that, we don't, we not only need Japanese businesses and people to go overseas, we need foreign businesses and foreigners to come to Japan. And along with technological progress, another element that could be equally important as a driver of is accumulation of intangible assets. Uh, this is the accumulation of skills gained by human resources. Under the lifetime employment system, Japanese people obtained skills throughout their career working for one company, but more recently we have begun to see change in the lifetime employment system, job change has become more prevalent. So there has to be a new system to accumulate skills that does not rely on lifetime employment. It's not possible to attract people just 
by pay. You need other incentives. People need this feeling that they are contributing to the society through working. For example, non-Japanese companies operating in Japan are very popular amongst Japanese university graduates. It's not just a high salary. The new graduates consider that if they work for non-Japanese companies in Japan, they would be given more opportunities to upgrade their skill and capacity building. So such technological progress and accumulation of intangible assets would go through the process of trial and error. And the biggest factor that would determine whether it could be achieved or not is the self-effort by each person. So rather than government taking the lead, it's more effective for the private sector to drive such efforts. Then what would be the appropriate role for the government to play? The government should be supporting basic research and improving basic education. In order to provide stability and happiness to people, it's not only economic growth that is necessary. Buildup of social capital and appropriate distribution of social capital is necessary, and that is complementary with market economy. According to Professor Zahiro Fumi, Social capital consists of institutional capital, public capital, and natural capital. And in institutional capital, uh, education and healthcare services are the most important elements. Supporting child education and offering high quality basic education to every child contributes to improvement of living standards more than supporting higher education or adult education. And therefore, when people are still in their childhood, high quality education should be provided. That's very important. Recently, Chicago's Professor Jim Heckman have elucidated that point through a series of research projects. Toma Picati has written books about distribution, redistribution between the middle class and the high net worth. That's where the focus tends to be attracted. But what's most important is the most vulnerable cohort and elevating the living standards of the most vulnerable. And at the same time as child education, support has to be provided to the elderly, elderly who cannot be protected only through self-effort or support by family. Those people need long-term care and pension, and that leads to more mental certainty on the part of the people. And of course, social capital or build up a social capital the first country by country. Is the European style more desirable or is the more econocentric American style more desirable? That would depend on the choice of uh, the people. But my personal preference would be the European style. I think that the European style would be more appropriate for the Japanese situation. Uh, after I returned to Japan, I realized how hot Japan has become. So global warming is really happening and we are reminded that it is real. It's very hot in Japan as hot as it is today, which means that it's even hotter in India and Africa, which is uh, extremely critical. So maintaining natural capital in order to respond to global warming becomes 
very important. But the current administration is focusing on providing subsidies, but in terms of the economics textbook, what kind of means for improvement is most effective? We don't know. So the best way is to tax activities that emit CO2. So carbon tax would be the most effective. Then businesses and people will try to develop a technology and people who discover low emission technology will be able to minimize the levied carbon tax. And I think that would be the most effective incentive. And in the EU, the introduction of carbon tax has uh, progressed. But uh, the unique characteristics is that they tax not just activities within the EU, but for example, import from Japan would be subject to carbon tax in the EU. So even if we don't introduce carbon tax in Japan, when businesses export to the EU, they would be subject to EU carbon tax. And when we expect that there will be more countries introducing carbon tax, Japan should be introducing carbon tax as early as possible in collaboration with the EU and to make that one of the hallmarks of response in global warming. And uh, as I said, technological transformation would require trial and error. So it's best to leave it up to the private sector to drive such efforts. In the United States, under the Biden administration, large-scale public investment and gigantic subsidies are being offered for the uh, EV sector in order to respond to global warming and environmental challenges. But Japan is relatively small in terms of the size of the economy in comparison to the United States. So subsidy-like policies will not be as effective. For example, US offers subsidies to the production and development of batteries for EVs. And then maybe companies would try to establish plants in the United States. But even if the Japanese government does the same thing, there's no assurance that companies will try to establish production facilities in Japan. So rather than those colossal subsidy programs, it's more effective in countries such as Japan to tax activities that emit greenhouse gases. Generally, when we talk about public investment, people tend to focus on initial investment, but maintenance is very important. So exposed investment uh, should also be given same level of attention. With the population aging, savings will decline and the savings investment balance will change. We will be shifting from excess savings uh, to savings shortage society. And that is expected to happen in a matter of decades. In order to maintain the balance between saving and investment while promoting FDI, we must stop the exacerbation of fiscal soundness. When worsening of fiscal soundness continues, people begin to feel more uncertain of the social security system. Sovereign and corporate ratings are downgraded, and businesses, Japanese businesses that have overseas operations, are placed at a disadvantage. Say, Toyota's rating is lower than Samsung. That's true. It's because JGB's rating is lower. So, when sovereign rating is downgraded, that is a disadvantage to the Japanese companies that do businesses overseas. Olivier Blanchard, if you read Professor Blanchard's 
papers that he has published recently, the interest rate of sovereign paper is lower than the nominal growth rate, so you don't have to worry so much. There are people who say so, but although that's one aspect, that's just one aspect, sovereign paper's interest rate cannot forever be kept low. If the sovereign paper is safe and people think that it's safe and there's uh, ample liquidity, then the rate remains low. But when people begin to feel uncertain about JGBs and uh, there's liquidity premium, then the rate goes up. And if you continue to read Blanchard's paper, he talks about fiscal sustainability that is triggered by the, the rate going up for sovereign paper. And then people say, oh, DOJ can buy back. But it's very dangerous for the central bank to purchase JGBs, and when BOJ is with excessive reserves, in other words, when the amount of money that is uh, offered to the BOJ account by the private sector banks, then the reserves, the, the interest rate will uh, of the reserves will have to be paid. And when interest rate goes up, that means that the payable interest rate will go up and JGB or BOJ will end up having to pay the interest rate for reserves. So just because JGB is purchased by the BOJ, that would be burden on the people. So before that kind of phenomenon unfolds, we need to offer a prospect for fiscal consolidation. And when there's longevity, the best way of fiscal consolidation is to have people work for longer years. In other words, the lifespan is 70 or 80 years today. So the career could last for more than 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And I think it's more natural to expect people to work for longer years. Then that would be positive to tax revenues and insurance premium and expenditure will decline. So that would be effective for fiscal consolidation and fiscal soundness. But if making people work for longer years is not enough, uh, there could be some criticism, but in the midst of aging of the population, it is general consumption tax with a large tax base. So increase of general consumption tax would become required, I think. Every year, the government comes up with fiscal policies and expectations, but uh, they're never right and I think there is a bias in their policies how do we think about declining birth rates and aging of the society then with regard to countermeasures for this issue uh, providing uh, allowances uh, and subsidies uh, for children is the uh, central uh, measure that is implemented today the greatest factor causing uh, declining birth rates and aging is the increase of the younger generation who don't get married and uh, even if they do get married they do not have enough time and so, therefore, in the face of such a situation, subsidies for children, subsidies for children is such that, according to the studies of sociologists and e economists, it's not very effective. And so, not rather than subsidies, uh, in order to deal with declining birth rates and aging, the trump card would be promoting uh, immigration. That is uh, what I think. Of course, uh, acceptance of immigration is such that uh, in the traditional Japanese society, whether for the good, for the better or the worse, uh, uh, it uh, does create waves. Uh, there are people who settle down, uh, who find the country attractive, and then there are those uh, who return to their country because they do not fit in. So when this happens, uh, the role of government is to 
set up a system where they're gradually accepted into society and uh, play an active role. Those who have settled in Japan and uh, their children, um, it's desirable if they uh, protect their own uh, culture and then uh, they uh, receive excellent education and medical care while preserving their culture and contribute to social and economic development uh, together with the Japanese. I think that is preferable. Acceptance of immigration is an issue uh, where there is uh, much opposition. So uh, political leadership uh, is uh, needed to realize Im immigration. For uh, many years, uh, people were concerned about the uh, deflation. And uh, in uh, the past 10 years, a uh, quantitative and qualitative monetary easing has uh, been implemented. These uh, measures uh, halt uh, deflation and achieve inflation of uh, 1 to 2% over the past decade. And uh, there was a certain degree of effectiveness. Uh, Maintaining inflation at around 1% to 2% uh, is important for active goods and labor markets and effective uh, monetary policy. If there's a zero uh, interest rate uh, constraint uh, to make monetary policy effective, this is, uh, I believe, is very important. So up until now, I have talked about uh, the preferred uh, macroeconomic uh, policy. After this, I'd like to spend some time talking about the, the present status of uh, the real uh, economic policies. Uh, in the real economic policies, uh, uh, short-term profits are pursued and economic uh, stimulus uh, measures are emphasized. Increasing the working period or carbon tax or promoting a consumption task or immigration uh, is uh, in the short run painful, although in the long run it may be effective and people tend to avoid that. And uh, with the uh, political leadership, and there has to be broad consensus uh, to effectuate uh, preferable policies, rather than the popular uh, policies, uh, uh, there's uh, a uh, tendency to depend on the subsidies. The next uh, slide is uh, my evaluation of the policy. The previous one was uh, the preferred uh, macroeconomic policy. And uh, we're looking here at uh, the real economic policies. The present uh, Japanese policy is such that uh, it's uh, heavily dependent on subsidies uh, to the situation where it's extreme and inflation is such that uh, monetary policies uh, should be used to stabilize uh, inflation. Uh, that's the um, uh, traditional uh, method to, uh, however, ease the pain uh, subsidies are being paid. And that, that is reality. As a result of this uh, a sustainable growth of environmental uh, sustainability or fiscal sustainability, or declining birth rate and aging population, um, to the achievability is uh, something that is really uh, questionable. That is why I have the three question marks here. I uh, tend to be pessimistic if uh, things uh, move along as is at the present. Where there's uh, some distance uh, from uh, politics, uh, monetary policy, I'd like to talk about uh, that for the moment. In the past, uh, we uh, effectuated uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, monetary easing, and the BOJ says it will continue that. In the past, uh, to put a stop to uh, deflation, uh, that was uh, justified. But uh, to uh, continue that uh, presently, I think is problematic. Now, the uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, monetary easing is such that when uh, policy rates are zero, 
to reduce uh, the long-term and short-term interest rate differentials and risk, risk premium uh, to uh, reduce the risk premium. That is how it works. Uh, when uh, the uh, long and short-term uh, rate differential risk premiums uh, may become uh, too small and the real estate and other asset prices uh, become too high, that is the risk. Uh, uh, presently, uh, real estate prices, uh, stock prices are going up, and uh, people say the economy is booming, so this is fine. Some say that, but uh, in the short run, it uh, boosts the economy. But uh, in the long run, a regional uh, a new, it will be difficult for new companies to enter the market and for young house households to acquire homes. Uh, as uh, what happened at the end of the 80s, uh, the younger generation in order to obtain households, uh, to obtain uh, medical care, uh, to uh, start a business, uh, it was very difficult in the long run. It, productivity improvements and uh, GDP um, uh, growth uh, uh, would be affected negatively. That is what I think. So uh, presently in uh, Europe and in the West, overall, uh, we're seeing a continuation of inflation throughout the world. In uh, the West, uh, over 2% of inflation uh, is expected to continue uh, for several years. In uh, Japan, because of uh, cheaper yen and uh, uh, imports, uh, effective Im imports, uh, we are seeing a continuation of inflation. Why is uh, 1 or 2% of inflation bad? Uh, under the Japanese system, pension does not increase along with inflation. Uh, pension is linked to the uh, nominal GDP, and uh, so uh, pension beneficiaries uh, are uh, deferred, and so uh, pension. Uh, Receipts uh, reduce and tax uh, system is such a uh, inflation, the nominal income uh, rises and the taxation uh, tax rates go up. Uh, so the real uh, pension uh, reduction and increase of uh, tax occurs, and uh, with a continuation of zero interest rate policy, uh, the real uh, interest rates uh, are negative, and as a result, uh, purchasing power, uh, especially for the creditors, uh, who uh, those uh, depositors um, see uh, a, a transfer from the uh, creditors uh, to the debtors. So uh, there's not a, such uh, a, a bad situation with inflation, some say. So it's not that, but uh, the present. Uh, 3% of inflation, if that continues for three years, and if we continue the zero interest rate policy, in uh, three years, approximately 10% with regard to deposits and, uh, and the government bonds, uh, we'll see a reduction in volume of the value by 10%. And uh, that would be inflation tax. And so if we leave inflation uh, unchecked, the monetary policy, rather than uh, stabilizing inflation, is uh, helping uh, public finance. And so the purpose uh, uh, is wrong. Uh, where the activities are being conducted for the wrong purpose. Uh, there are people, uh, older people, uh, who are dependent on pensions and deposits, and they are finding the life very difficult. In the short run, policies uh, uh, that bring about pain uh, but uh, uh, are fine if in the long run, if uh, the citizens uh, are convinced of that, and uh, I believe uh, it's uh, doable. In the uh, Noda government, uh, with regard to the social insurance and tax uh, integral reform, uh, three parties agreed, and the other administration increased uh, consumption tax twice. Macroeconomic policies should be easy for the citizens to understand, and it should be complementary, complementary to market economy. And so for this purpose, open economy and uh, technological uh, progress, sustainable development, uh, through this and the uh, improvement of basic uh, education and medical uh, care and to improve uh, livelihood infrastructure and to uh, sustain uh, 
carbon tax and uh, to sustain the environment through carbon tax and the fiscal uh, sustainability uh, through increase of consumption tax and the working period uh, extension and uh, dealing uh, with uh, immigration and uh, also uh, declining birth rates. I believe uh, that appropriate the monetary policies uh, should uh, be used to stabilize inflation and I believe it's important to distribute the appropriate policies uh, appropriate for each goal. Thank you very Thank you very much. My name is Mana Nakazora of BNP Pariba. In addition to Professor Aoki, I was blessed with this opportunity to witness the renowned Professor Kiyotaki in person. So I am so impressed. Why are you making a comment? I think many of you are thinking so, but uh, here I am sitting here. So let me try to directly ask questions to Professor Kiyotaki on what I have been thinking day in, day out. Of course, I'm not in the right position to be a a justified commentator, but let me try. Thank you very much, Professor Kiyotaki, for the wonderful presentation. I have a few questions. Uh, setting aside whether you will respond to all the questions, I would like to ask you questions and share with you my impression. I'm a private sector member of the Economic and Fiscal Policy Council, and you touched upon that in your presentation. And a special session was established in the council when we talk about when we think about the macroeconomy and the economic policy. This is taken up by the special session, and Professor Kiyotake uh, and other experts uh, joined. Why this kind of system was established? There are only four private sector members, and against new capital and new challenges, we can decide whether it's the right thing economically and whether we can explain fully. And the cabinet or the government wasn't so sure. So if that could be uh, assured and given certainty by the experts like you, then it's good. That's probably why the special session was established. As economic policy, you said most of what the government is doing is subsidies, but that's not the, doing the right thing. What they are saying is right, but the way they are trying to solve the challenges is wrong. If that's the case, that's what I heard you say. What should we change? So rather than being subsidies, at the outset, you mentioned that direct policies for each objective should be assigned. But even if we try to do that, I think we have to prioritize. So what's top priority in Japan today? At the Economic and Fiscal Policy Council, growth is considered a priority. And in order to achieve economic growth, green is an important factor. That's what we are talking about. And Professor, you said uh, in the area of green, carbon tax is non-existent in Japan. And we are talking about charging or surcharge, not taxation. If it's not carbon tax or rather surcharge, do you think that the economic effect would be the same or different? And on the part of the Japanese government, in order to try to promote green uh, surcharge and emissions trading by creation of emissions trading market, they are trying to deal with the challenge two ways. Do you think this is economic rationale? Peak taxation was much talked about, but emissions trading and surcharge, if that tax is replaced by these two means, is there a difference in effectiveness? Another point is a flexible labor market. And you talked about uh, human capital and accumulation of human capital. I have the impression that you mentioned human capital quite frequently, but when we listen to the debate in, in Japan, reskilling is the key word. So reskill the employees. What is your view on such matters? And, sorry, low birth rate, response to low birth rate. 
As you said, accepting immigrants, I also agree that that's the best idea. But maybe immigrants don't want to come to Japan. Yen is too cheap for annual income. Relatively, the annual income of Japan is low. So those situations taken into consideration, do you still think that accepting immigrants is effective and it's doable in Japan? And finally, one last question, interest rate. In the special session, you talked about one to 2%. And you probably are saying uh, to the BOJ that the BOJ should be more flexible in terms of monetary policy. And many such articles were uploaded. Putting aside those commentaries, you said that 1% or 2% is probably the right level. If we look at the price level today, I think people expect that prices will be hiking further. What do you think about the current level of interest rate? Uh, monetary policy is independently applied, but what should be the objective or target of monetary policy? And if easing continues for too long, as you said, the fiscal exacerbation continues. And can we go on unattended to, like what we are doing? And when I met with an American colleague, I asked him whether it's good to travel to Japan because the price is cheap. Now, talking about cheap yen, uh, as an economist, not as a market participant, as an economist, how do you feel about the cheap yen? Sorry about the many questions. Thank you very much uh, for your diverse uh, range of questions. Uh, to what extent I can answer is something uh, I'm not sure of. Uh, I've uh, jotted down some things. Uh, so uh, first, uh, on the new capitalism, the new form of capitalism is what the Kishida government is talking about. The new form of capitalism is such that, as my interpretation, with uh, aiming for stability along with growth, uh, at improving social capital and appropriate distribution. That is included in the new form of capitalism. That's my interpretation. And so, I believe uh, growth uh, should be uh, prioritized. Uh, and the long term uh, growth uh, is uh, very important. But it does take time. Inevitably, it does take time. If uh, economic measures uh, uh, are implemented in the short run, it does not uh, necessarily serve as economic stimulus. And uh, the immediately effective uh, measures, for example, uh, uh, bringing uh, semiconductor factories from Taiwan, there are such measures. But uh, if uh, the Taiwanese company and Japanese companies uh, make uh, money out of this. They would do this of their own accord without the government uh, telling them to do so. What uh, the government should work on is a very basic uh, aspect, a basic uh, research and basic uh, research. It's not applied research, it's a basic research uh, which the government should be working on. And it takes an, a, a very long time. But to render this effective, uh, basic uh, research and basic education uh, would be most important. And uh, there are ideas coming in from uh, all parts of the world. And uh, so ideas uh, should be exchanged uh, between Japan and overseas uh, um, very freely. So if you just go to uh, Silicon Valley uh, to obtain ideas, uh, that is not sufficient. Uh, that does not lead to acquiring uh, uh, present uh, technology. It has to be uh, an ongoing process with regard to carbon tax. I'm not uh, really an expert on this, but the basic thinking is uh, to, in order to make a carbon trading uh, market, how do you apportion, how, uh, that's, uh, how do you allocate is the most important. Uh, there's the theorem, of course, uh, if the transaction cost is zero, it doesn't matter who you allocate it to. Um, but uh, Kors himself said uh, 
Uh, it's called the course theorem. Uh, it's uh, just an example. And uh, you should not take all of that uh, for what it is. What he's, uh, he is saying is that when the, it's important uh, for there to be friction in trade. And if you ignore that, uh, very uh, strange uh, uh, results come about. And he uh, cited this as an example. So my thinking would be that uh, CO2, to reduce the CO2, if that's the objective, uh, taxation should be done on the emission of CO2 itself. I think that would be a most uh, more direct approach. And having done so, uh, those who tried hard uh, would see their uh, carbon tax reduced, and I believe that that would be an incentive. Also, with regard to employment, uh, human capital formation through employment, and presently, uh, Shida government is talking about uh, reskilling and providing subsidies uh, for this. Uh, it's the same as uh, providing money for applied research. The basics are here again important. So if you uh, become older, rather than uh, pay people when they become older, it's better to pay them when they're young. Uh, in particular, early childhood uh, education is very important uh, uh, to uh, form the basics there, is more effective than uh, providing money afterwards. And uh, if you study uh, after uh, you become an adult, you have to pay yourself and you have to spend time yourself. It's, uh, it's not something that you do with government money. That's my thinking. And at the same time, companies with regard to employment, may uh, change, and that's good. Of course, uh, monetary uh, offers uh, for uh, releasing people uh, would be effect uh, would be acceptable. And with regard to declining birth rates, I talked about immigration. In Japan, uh, wages aren't that high, and so uh, not very many people are willing to come to Japan, but there is that. But uh, Japan is uh, actually quite popular. That is, uh, the United States and China have a, a belief in power. And so it's uh, good for the winners, uh, for the losers, uh, the society uh, turns the cold shoulder. And uh, not everyone can be winners. Uh, there are people who are tired in the Chinese society, and uh, you find a lot of those uh, in the United States as well. And I believe uh, that uh, there's a considerable number of people willing to come to Japan. Of course, uh, you have to pay a certain amount of uh, wages, uh, otherwise you won't be able to attract them. As to why in Japan wages uh, do not go up, one thing is the lack of growth of productivity, and so wages are not growing. And as a result, um, uh, we discussed earlier that uh, prices are cheaper in Japan, so it's good. But the non-tradable uh, goods uh, or non-traded goods are linked to wages. So uh, without an increase of wages, uh, the non-traded goods uh, relative price uh, compared to uh, traded goods go, go down. And so traded goods uh, uh, are subject to international competition, so there's uh, not a large difference uh, from country to country. When it comes to non-traded goods, it's very much linked to wages. And in the past, in Japan, non-traded goods uh, were expensive. For example, in Tokyo, uh, prices uh, were extremely high, uh, the, mo the highest uh, among the markets of the world. That used to be the case, but presently, uh, Tokyo prices have gone down. That is uh, because uh, uh, productivity uh, growth uh, was uh, uh, Blackluster and uh, uh, tradable goods went, uh, prices go down. And there's a balanced uh, Samuelson effect. 
and uh, the non-tradable uh, goods uh, prices went down uh, compared to uh, overseas. When we, it's in a time of uh, earth, uh, uh, high uh, economic growth, uh, the prices were high. In the past uh, 30 years, uh, it went the other way. And so uh, relatively, uh, uh, prices uh, became cheaper. That is because growth rate has gone down. So on the immigration issue, to boost uh, economic uh, growth, uh, that is something that you have to work on uh, very patiently. And uh, with regard to inter-interest rates, 1% uh, of inflation rate is fine, I said, but the BOJ uh, said uh, uh, we're working on 2%, uh, so uh, don't say that. It's uncalled for. But economically uh, speaking, 1% or 2%, uh, or 2 uh, there's not much difference. That is what I think. Now, uh, inflation uh, exceeding 3%. Um, if that continues, uh, that's not good. The subsidies uh, are uh, used uh, to boost uh, for, to boost uh, developments uh, for electricity and gas, uh, and uh, so uh, it's three percent. If you take away the uh, subsidies, it'll go. Uh, the inflation rate will go beyond the four percent. It's uh, uh, an inflation rate uh, which goes uh, far uh, beyond uh, the. A target, so that's not very good. So inflation rate uh, should be two percent or one or two percent to stabilize at that uh, inflation rate. I think would be good, and uh, as a result, you have to uh, consolidate uh, public finance. If you had to choose, firstly, patiently technology uh, advancement and uh, technology accumulation uh, uh, to make improvements there. And you have to be patient here. It's not immediate. And what's important here is an uh, open economy. Ideas and capital uh, should be freely exchanged. So the system should uh, allow for that. And the other is uh, fiscal sustainability to anyone's eyes. If thing, if nobody would, would believe that things would continue as is. Uh, I'm not saying that things have to be balanced uh, immediately, but in the next 10 years or so, uh, the direction uh, to be pursued is something that we have to have prospects for. And in the United States, uh, fiscal consolidation, what contributed most to fiscal consolidation was in the Reagan days, President Reagan days, they felt that uh, uh, social security would go bust if they did not do anything. And so the Democrats and the Republicans uh, came to an agreement, and very gradually, uh, they just uh, uh, raised uh, the uh, starting age. And uh, they spent about 20 years to raise the age, little by little. And so Japan does not need to raise immediately, but to raise uh, gradually. So fiscal consolidation is such that we have to develop some prospects for. Thank you very much. I talked about carbon tax, but carbon tax insertion would be simply effective. I think so. I'm not well versed, but searcher is in essence a tax, so it's not a subsidy more like a tax and it may appear to be the same but it's different so uh, carbon tax versus subsidies there is a difference i see uh, there are many questions from the participants but can we continue between ourselves yes please continue your discussion thank you very much then I have follow-up questions now that I've listened to your responses to the initial round of questions. You talked about basic education and basic research. That's where we need to spend more money. But in terms of appearance in economic policy, if the government says we're doing this basic education and basic research, does that make the people happy? Not so. It's not really flashy for the voters, but it's still important. So it's important, but you said that if there is consensus, then we can implement. 
what needs to be done in order to secure the consensus of the voters? Biden is uh, came with with the IRA, and that's really flashy and catchy, and people would follow. And EU is good at that. They come up with the Green New Deal. And Japanese governments are not really good at such action. Is it because they're not doing technically the right thing? Or is it because the voters are not looking at the essence? What's wrong and what should be done? That's a very difficult question. Economists, regarding how policies ought to be implemented, we are not really sensitive. We are not really well versed in coming forth with an analysis on how policies used should be implemented. That's the job of politicians. Roosevelt, when he came up with a new deal, included social security. And what he did back then is whether we use tax to fund that or whether we use pension to fund that. And there was a big debate. And Roosevelt said, if we use pension, insurance as the funding source, then that would not be abandoned by the next government, even if there is a change of government. So vested interest, we need to gradually come up with people with vested interest. So that applies to basic research and basic education. You're right, it's not really flashy, but although we are in a different discipline, basic research is quite interesting. Oh, this is a new discovery in basic research. And the, that's, those new discoveries are interesting. And if people will find out that Japanese researchers are doing well in such areas, that would empower the voters. Biofoundry is one big area recently, and in the area of biofoundries, solar and CO2 to be used to process protein. There are people who are trying to develop such technology for global warming rather than emitting co2 using sunlight and co2 creating and producing protein that's great so there is a really fantasy in basic research and if you really hit the target then you could make billions of money. So if we begin to see examples, it will become more popular amongst voters. Thank you very much. You said when there are more than one objective, there's the right way to respond to each objective, but the government is overly dependent on subsidies and we need to change that situation. I was very much persuaded. And further in your presentation, you talked about the rating, sovereign rating and corporate rating, and when they are downrated, it becomes problematic. I have constantly been in the area of credit, so I was very happy when you touched upon rating because you're such an expert in economy economics. But finally, you said that there's still hope in Japan, and that may be in the area of basic research. From the US perspective, there are some frustrations when Americans look at Japan. But what are you frustrated about Japan? And what are you uh, really impressed about Japan? What I'm frustrated is that the, there's a trend to try to hide the truth. I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to say this or not, but be it in the United States or in Europe, the auction for communications uh, 
wave spectrum a strip spectrum auction yes the japanese in japan governments allocate spectrum yes and these frequencies are really valuable and then at the beginning the government gave all the bandwidth to ntt and ntt docomo and softbank complained and then in the next round of allocation they gave some spectrum to softbank and this is so valuable and these companies are not paying a penny and i was very much frustrated as an outsider so when there's a value you shouldn't be doing everything in the inner circle on the other hand what do i think is the advantage of japan when we look at japanese culture there are many merits wrote a commentary to Professor Matsuura's theory of Japanese culture. And Professor Matsuura does research on traditional Japanese culture. It's not just based upon nostalgia, but in Japanese literature, uh, there is factors hidden in Japanese literature and Japanese culture that will offer happiness to mankind. And it is true that there is potential in Japanese literature and Japanese culture to offer happiness to the totality of mankind. So I'm proud of that. I see. Smile zero in. Yes, people say that it's Japanese are not great as trickling down the cost to the consumers, but yes, changing that to appropriate revenue, maybe there could be a change of direction. That was my interpretation. I hope I interpreted your response in the right way. Yes, that's right. So uh, this is will be the end of the first round of our conversation, and later on maybe we Thank you. go back. We've received a lot of uh, questions uh, from the listeners. Uh, I'd like to uh, take the liberty of uh, putting some questions uh, which are about the same thing uh, together. And uh, we'd like to ask uh, Professor Kiyotaki as uh, well as uh, Ms. Nakazora. A lot of people uh, have talked about fiscal uh, consolidation and uh, raised questions about this. First, on the fiscal consolidation and inflation, uh, I have uh, several questions on both. Um, with uh, rising inflation, of course, as you say, uh, Professor Kiyotake, the uh, government bonds go down in value, whether that's good or bad. And also, with regard to monetary policy, when inflation go rises, uh, most probably interest rates uh, will be hiked. And when interest rate payments are made, uh, this will be an increase of burden. And so inflation, is it really, uh, uh, does it really work to uh, deal uh, with uh, fiscal consolidation or is it negative for fiscal consolidation? Could you answer this question first? On fiscal consolidation and inflation, the relation between the two, inflation is such that uh, there's a, if there's unexpected inflation, government the bond the values or a nominal value of uh, assets uh, go down but uh, when inflation is expected uh, it is reflected in interest rates so inflation is such uh, that uh, right after the war when inflation occurs uh, the government bond uh, real value goes down uh, and if that continues uh, for a long time uh, gradually interest rates will also rise and if you try to curb inflation co to control inflation uh, the taylor rule uh, comes into play more than inflation if inflation goes up by one percent in real terms uh, 
to reduce uh, interest rates. Uh, in uh, nominal interest rates, you have to raise interest rates by uh, over 1%. There is that rule. So uh, in the end, uh, uh, it will be an increase in interest rates and you will pay heavily afterwards. That's the uh, textbook uh, principle. And uh, unexpected inflation, when this occurs, uh, who wins and who loses? Of course, uh, the uh, greatest winner is uh, the uh, government. And so uh, government bond uh, real value in the short run, when unexpected inflation uh, occurs, it goes down. So who will be the loser? Who is the greatest loser? Those who have uh, nominal assets, people who own the nominal assets, uh, uh, deposits and postal savings or bank uh, savings, uh, bank deposits, people who own these will suffer. The high net worth have uh, stocks and uh, land uh, property in larger percentage, so uh, uh, inflation does not affect them much negatively. So those are under middle class who uh, save in uh, you know, deposits stand to lose the most. So inflation, in a certain sense, is uh, unfair. And when inflation uh, continues, in the end, uh, interest rates uh, go up and fiscal consolidation, uh, it does not uh, serve uh, to consolidate finances. So uh, if you want to uh, do fiscal consolidation, you do not uh, dilute it with inflation. You have to uh, deal with it by increasing uh, income and expenditure. And you have to increase the working period. Uh, that's most effective. You have to take the issue head on. Thank you. Nakazura-san, do you have any comments? Yes, I was nodding. People working for longer years. When I think about that, people say old people exit. Let's give opportunities to young people. Yes, partly I understand that opportunities should be given to youth, but I think you were saying that Seniors should also work because the longer your career, uh, it's a positive for paying back debt. So there are both sides. But for the company, if they continue to hire elderly, that would be cost to the businesses. So once they become 60, you have to review the employment contract. Is that what you are suggesting? The seniority system and the conventional wage system based upon seniority uh, has its limits. So at one point, there has to be a major overhaul of wage. But I think there are many people who still want to continue to work even after the so-called retirement age. Even in our industry, the new professor's wage goes up and those who are headhunted from other institutes are paid well. If you continue to be at the same university, uh, you don't get much raise. So uh, at one point, uh, your ray, your pay is exceeded by a newcomer. But, so there has to be a review. Once you become older, you have to be ready to accept lower increase of wage. Arthur Goldberger, when I was in Wisconsin, there was this professor, Goldberger, and he talked with a social science expert, and they were saying, you aged well, and Goldberger said, when people stop listening to you, you have to shut up. So, old people, when you feel that people have stopped listening to you, that's when you have to shut up. So, in that sense, if we see more people working for longer years, that kind of problem should emerge. You can't become an obstacle to the young people. But at the same time, if you retire at the statutory retirement age, you won't be able to afford your living. So as long as you are healthy, you should continue to work. And it depends 
on the person. There is a difference in the level of health. If you continue, if you start working after high school and continue to work until 70, that means your career was very long. But if you only start working after graduating from college, your commencement age of work uh, is later. So you should continue to work for longer years. So depending on the person, you should find the appropriate position and there could be a very appropriate remuneration system. Thank you very much. There are two additional questions from the participants related to what you have just talked about. One is the source of funds for uh, fiscal consolidation. You are advocating the consumption tax, but what about other taxes like taxation on high income earners or property tax? or corporate income tax in comparison to consumption tax. What about increasing those taxes? And another point is with regards to having people work for longer, shouldn't we abolish the statutory retirement age system? But from the economics viewpoint, how should we analyze the statutory retirement age system? For fiscal consolidation, uh, the financial resources for this uh, would be such that the biggest uh, resource uh, would be extending uh, the working period, the number of years that people work. If you extend the working period, uh, there'll be fewer beneficiaries of pensions, and uh, those who pay uh, will increase. Uh, and uh, healthy uh, lifespan will also be extended. So uh, medical expenses uh, would benefit from this. Uh, so as a financial resource, uh, the largest is extending the working period. In the case of the United States, that was the case. And when you uh, extend the retirement age or the retirement system, uh, I think uh, needs to be phased out. It's uh, important to review uh, after certain years, uh, but to take the retirement age to force retirement, uh, with, uh, for pilots that might be necessary, for example, but uh, for the general uh, type of profession, I think it's better to phase out uh, the retirement age. Now, consumption tax and corporate tax or income tax, if you compare these, Increase of uh, the elderly, in increase of retirees uh, would mean uh, that uh, income tax base will not be very broad when this happens. So uh, consumption tax is a much larger base for taxation. And as for corporate tax, uh, different uh, corporations engage in ways to reduce their tax. They might relocate their company overseas. And uh, same with high net worth individuals. They have a lot of assets, but they can transfer that and uh, to increase taxes on assets of the wealthy or to increase uh, income tax for the wealthy uh, would perhaps uh, lead to them fleeing to other countries, so it's not very effective. So at the consumption stage, to tax uh, uh, would uh, be more effective in terms of increasing tax income because it's the base is broader. There are people who suffer from this, so uh, the minimum uh, livelihood should be guaranteed. So. Uh, so that should uh, come in hand hand in hand with the increase in consumption tax. Thank you very much. A slightly different subject. Professor, you mentioned the importance of basic research and basic education. And participants are asking a question related to that. Then when you look at the Japanese education system, what's the most problematic aspect? And what are the advantages of the Japanese education system? So how should we fix the Japanese education system? One point regarding Japanese basic education, it wasn't so bad, but at one point in time, people began to introduce more flexibility in compulsory education and new education 
methodology was introduced, and that might have been counterproductive. Basic education is about having children memorize, be it Chinese characters or calculation. You have to have them memorize and have that knowledge deeply rooted physically. So if you abandon that kind of teaching methodology, it's not that good. And also, you should teach well. Prep schools or prep schools. I went there and found really good teachers. So teachers that teach well, I think we need to train teachers to teach well. So regarding basic education, we used to say abacus and reading and writing. So Japanese language or mathematics, those basics must be well taught. And you shouldn't try to, to do the short track. Euclid geometri geometrics. I think it's well built as a subject that could be used for teaching. How do you prove a problem? So classic geometrics, physics, biology, having the children read the textbooks and memorize the textbooks, I think that's the best way. Math, Japanese language, physics, when the students are taught such basic knowledge, then once they enroll in higher education, their skills and knowledge would flourish. I agree. Um, one of the uh, problems here in Japan is a chat a GPT. AI and uh, these are being used, uh, for example, uh, uh, summertime homework. Uh, uh, the children that do not do this uh, because uh, the, um, the use, and you are, you're saying that cramming is important, uh, is refreshing. The recent trends and, and cramming is also good. Um, so, uh, what's the effect of uh, cramming? Uh, how do we uh, try to strike a balance uh, between a more liberal uh, education using ChatGPT and AI and uh, cramming? If you use ChatGPT and AI uh, well, it's effective. Uh, for example, uh, recently, uh, Sota Fuji, uh, uh, who is uh, a, a prodigy uh, in Shogi, uh, he uses a lot of uh, AI. Uh, he's not only using AI, however, he does a lot of thinking himself, and he thinks this way, this way, and that way. And he uses also AI, and that's why he's uh, the prodigy that he is. And just working with AI. Well, basically, uh, there's a lot of uh, data uh, which AI uses to find uh, some uh, uh, principle or rule about uh, what to do uh, going forward and what to, uh, to think about what to do it is something that uh, AI is not uh, suited for. So if you use AI well, that's good. That's no problem. But uh, to use AI well and beyond the AI, you have to think about why certain things are the way they are and uh, what is the scheme of uh, uh, how does uh, space work and what is uh, life. Uh, you have to think about this uh, basic issues. And it has to be uh, human beings that uh, think about these things. It, uh, so it's very important to uh, think about basics. Uh, what is consciousness, for example? How does consciousness work? And in biology, in the past, uh, the mystery of life uh, was what people talked about. The, uh, presently, uh, we know a lot of things about the genes and the structure of genes. Physics and uh, biology uh, have not uh, really uh, merged at the moment. And uh, people's consciousness, human beings' consciousness, uh, how does it work? And what about the human brain? How does it function? To analyze uh, the brain uh, is comes close to analyzing languages because uh, it's only human beings uh, that uh, use language uh, to uh, write prose and so forth. So uh, by analyzing languages, uh, perhaps uh, this would lead to uh, understanding human beings. Chomsky says that. If we look at Chomsky, I... Uh, we uh, 
may think we agree with him uh, to understand human beings and the brain. So to start with the language is not a bad thing. Recently, um, maybe as people say that AI would be passed, be able to pass the entrance exam to University of Tokyo. Maybe AI would actually pass the entrance exam, but after entering the university, I will not uh, continue to learn. Of course, uh, there are students uh, at my university that don't uh, learn and that don't study. Thank you. Another question regarding basic education. Is there a country that's doing well in terms of providing a basic education? I think Finland is doing well. They inject much efforts in providing basic education and quite unexpectedly, Iran is a closed nation, but female education and they are trying to foster highly educated female resources so Iranian mathematicians uh, female Iranian mathematicians have emerged and I think they are doing the crime school style education in order to uh, foster such geniuses and in Hungary they have this system of gifted children, and they have a system of providing such cramming education to gifted children. And uh, I think Finland is a good doing quite well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Switching gears a little bit, I'd like to move to this question. In Japan, in the past 20 years, we had low inflation. And at the same time, uh, there was declining birth rates and aging of the society. And uh, in the end, uh, the trend of declining uh, birth rates and uh, aging of the society, does it work uh, as a deflationary factor or is it a uh, inflationary factor? That is the question. Uh, declining uh, birth rates and the relationship of that to inflation. There's no direct uh, relationship as such. Of course, uh, low growth rate as a result of that. Non-traded goods. Relative price goes down, and so uh, deflation is prone to occur. A balasa Samuelson effect uh, is there, but uh, declining birth rate uh, itself uh, affecting inflation rate. When you ask about that, I uh, pro think that probably is not the case. The number of children uh, indeed is declining, but from what I heard recently, more than you might think in among the high net worth uh, group, but there's an increase in children. Uh, same in the United States. In the past, uh, the poor had more children, but uh, the situation has been reversed. Uh, the high net worth uh, wealthy individuals that have uh, the housing and the schools and uh, the place of work uh, close to each other. They have a lot of time and they have a lot of money, and so they have more children, a larger number of children. If you go to uh, the uh, um, condominiums in Kojimachi, the expensive area, there's a lot of children. Um, there are good uh, schools there, and it's uh, easier to commute from there. So uh, people seem to have money and time. So declining birth rates and aging society. Well, I don't think uh, providing uh, subsidies to deal with this problem is a good idea. So uh, changing the way people work and also trying to increase the number of people who get, who get married. Otherwise, we do that. Uh, unless we do this, uh, I don't think we can help to uh, increase children. If immigrants, uh, if there's a, a larger number of immigrants, I think there'll be an increasing number of children, I think. This is a question uh, to both of you, Professor Kiyotaki and Ms. Nakazora. Professor Kiyotaki, for Japan to be connected with the world, especially you said that it's important for Japan to be intellectually connected with the world. 
For Japan to be well connected to the world, what kind of measures should be implemented? And I would like to ask the same question to Ms. Nakazora since you work for a global company. Yes. In order for Japan to be connected to the world, Japanese people must go overseas more frequently. And at the same time, we should have foreigners come to Japan. There are many Japanese going outside and companies investing overseas, but there's still not so many, very few home companies that are investing in Japan. So I think we are still with a closed country mentality, and there seems to be some kind of psychological barrier when we accept foreigners as they come to Japan. And also, we need more Japanese people competing on the global stage. But I think Japanese culture can penetrate easily in cultures of countries around the world. Uh, take an example of manga. French people say that uh, their parents were really busy when they were small, so they used to spend time reading Japanese manga. So they learned Japanese through manga and Sore Yuke and they all know the Japanese words that are used in Japanese manga. So maybe Japanese culture could be used to be well connected to the world. Thank you. That was a great answer and there's nothing to add. But I think there's a slightly high barrier in Japan for those who want to go out and for those who want to come in. And when someone is transferred from London to New York, uh, they would contact us immediately. But there are not so many opportunities for those who are based in Tokyo to go to London or to New York. The world has become so borderless, but even them, Japanese, have some kind of psychological barrier inside themselves for both going overseas and for accepting people from abroad. So that's one thing that we need to tackle, and also various conditions. For example, when you want those who, Japanese people who were active on the international stage to repatriate to Japan, how well do you pay them? And what kind of conditions would you offer? US, EU, and Asia, there's uh, the nanny system. So even if they come to Japan, there won't be so many nannies. So how can they raise their family? So if we want to attract highly skilled human resources, uh, I think that kind of system should be well established. So for example, where you're working now, uh, the non-Japanese uh, being uh, successful, I think it's difficult in areas where they need to speak Japanese. Yes, that is true. I'm working for a French company. For the French people, uh, there uh, among the French people, there are those who uh, speak amazingly good Japanese. Uh, they have wives who are Japanese, and they speak like a woman, and they say something like yada, which is a woman's uh, way of uh, expressing uh, and I think there's a lot of affinity now. Uh, but if uh, th there are those who don't speak any Japanese at all, when Japanese, uh, they find it difficult to be successful overseas, I think there's a language issue there. Thank you very much. I still have uh, several uh, questions remaining, but uh, we're running out of time. So uh, perhaps uh, we'd like to, we should uh, close at this point. Thank you very much uh, to the two speakers. Uh, thank you to all. Thank you.